January 7, 2004. My name is Janet Palmer, and I'm interviewing Mr. Bob Battle for the Veterans History Project at the Atlanta History Center. Mr. Battle, will you please state your full name and spell it for me? Robert W. Battle, B-A-T-T-L-E. And what is your uh, date of birth and place of birth? July 25th, 1922 in Rome, Georgia. Uh, what branch of the service were you in? U.S. Navy. And what was your rank, the highest rank? That Lieutenant. Lieutenant. And what uh, ship were you on? Then? I was on the USS Knox, K-N-O-X, APA 46. Can you tell me a little bit about, before going into the service, what a little bit about your background and what you were doing at that time? I was in, in school at Emory University and scheduled to graduate in June of 1943. Right after Pearl Harbor in January 1942, a program was offered to go into the Navy and the Reserve and be allowed to finish your college education. I did this in January or February of 1942 I've forgotten it was a V program, and I can't remember the number, V5 or something like that. And there, I was left alone completely as far as the service was concerned until I graduated from Emory in June of 1943. And two weeks later, I reported to the Midshipman School at Columbia University in New York City. What, what kind of degree did you get from Emory University? I got a BA in journalism. So, now when did you go to Columbia? In June of 1943. Can you tell me a little bit about your experiences there? Do you remember arriving there? And yes, I, 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 I left Atlanta on a train. First time I'd been off by myself ever. And arrived in New York alone. And first time I'd been to New York, I remember distinctly looking up through the roof of a cab to see the tall buildings. And I spent the night in the hotel, in a hotel, and reported to Columbia the next morning, I think it was at six o'clock, in a long line of people who were going in, entering that, that class of midshipman school. How did you feel? Scared. Scared. It was the 14th class at Columbia, uh, the midshipman school. We were quartered in John J. Hall, which is right across the street from the well-known Columbia Library. Uh, my roommate was from Indianapolis. Uh, we, we started out as apprentice seamen for the first 30 days, uh, dressed in nothing but khakis, uh, drills, classes, uh, athletic training, a uh, lot of studying, and at the end of 30 days we were promoted to midshipmen and could get into our blue regular midshipmen uniforms. Uh, I worked on the, um, we had a yearbook, I worked on the yearbook. I sang in the choir, which was a magnificent experience. The uh, service for the midshipmen was at 5 o'clock on Sunday afternoons. And it was at Riverside Church upon Riverside Drive, the old Harry Emerson Fosdick Church. And we marched, the choir marched separately, and the Corps of Midshipmen marched in. And the choir always used the Navy hymn as the benediction. And that was very, very moving. But the choir would go to choir practice on sometime during the week, and we'd always sing going up and down the street going from Columbia up to Riverside Church. How far was that? Oh, it's about uh, 10 blocks, I guess. But we always have a crowd hanging out the windows listening to us sing as we went back and forth. We were graduated from uh, St. John the Divine, the Cathedral of St. John the Divine, the Episcopal Cathedral. Uh, the church, longest church, the largest church in the world, I think it's one foot longer than, than St. Peter's. And uh, 
one of my classmates recalls uh, his impression was that he heard this music way off in the background when we marched in, and it was our band. But you could hardly hear them. They were way down the nave. So we were graduated from there and given, I guess, maybe a week's leave or two weeks leave and reported to wherever we had been assigned. And I was assigned to the <clears throat> amphibious training base at Little Creek, Virginia. Uh, arriving there in November, I guess, of 1943. And we trained uh, in the landing craft, the small landing craft that would take uh, troops ashore in an invasion. Uh, it was very cold. We wore sometimes as much as four or five layers of clothing and scrambling around the decks of those little boats out in the Chesapeake Bay. If we'd fallen in, we'd have sunk like a stone. Uh, but it was very, very cold. We were scraping the ice off of the, you know, the uh, foul weather gear. We were there from November until Janu early January, and then were sent advanced uh, amphibious training to Fort Pierce, Florida, which was a contrast in weather and we were in shorts. <laughs> but we trained, we practiced landings constantly. And how to take uh, the landing craft would, would breach, turn sideways on a current, and how to get them off. And the uh, crew would come in and drag those boats off. We had to, the uh, engine was cool with a water trap and it would get sand in it and overheat and the engine would shut off. So you were constantly cleaning the sand traps on these LCVPs and LCMs. We graduated from uh, that class and went on a troop train from Fort Pierce, Florida to Brooklyn, New York. How did you get trucks? Train. Yeah, how did you get from Fort Pierce to? On the train. On the tra oh, the train. The train. It was a regular cattle car. Really? Yeah. What they called, I think, in World War One, a 40 and 8. You know, 40 men and 8 horses. But there were bunks about, I guess, four or five high in these cars. And... Uh, How long did it take you to get there? A little over a day, I guess. Did you eat on there and everything, or did they stop? Yeah, no, they had uh, had a mess car. <laughs> And we then joined the, <clears throat> the USS Knox, which had been commissioned about 10 days before. Uh, she was an attack transport. Had been, uh, the hull had been built in Pascagoula, Mississippi by Engels Shipyard. And she was converted. She would have just been a freighter. She was converted to a, an attack transport in Brooklyn. And we went aboard as the landing, the, uh, landing ship crew. Uh, with a lot of ships, that group was kept separate from the ship's crew. But our captain was smart enough to realize that that would just create a schism within the crew. So we were immediately integrated into the ship's crew. Uh, I went into the communications department. Some of my classmates went into as deck officers, uh, some as radio officers, some as engineer officers, but I was assigned to the communications department. And uh, we did our shakedown crews, but I still stood deck watches on the bridge. Uh, we did our shakedown crews. We took the, the Knox from Brooklyn to, down to uh, the Chesapeake to Norfolk. And it was just as light as a toothpick on the water. And I was sick for the first eight hours, deathly sick. But uh, we were in, uh, we reported back to Norfolk. And then we did a training up and down the Chesapeake for about a month. And then in April of April or May of 1944, uh, we sailed from Norfolk 
and went down and went through the Panama Canal and out to Pearl Harbor. And then from Pearl Harbor we went over to Maui and took aboard a Marine Division. Uh, an attack transport carries troops and all of their equipment, trucks, tanks, everything. And we did practice landings at Maui. And then on June the 15th, 1944, we invaded Saipan. That was the first of the, uh, of the invasions after Kwajalein and uh, in Uitak. How did, do you remember that? Oh yes, very well. I remember that very, very well. Uh, my assignment was to lead a wave of boats into the beach. Uh, the boats, we'd offload the boats and then they would circle out off the ship and be called in one by one and loaded, by, loaded with troops who would come down the side of the ship on rope ladders. And then when all of the group, when all of the ship, when all of the boats were loaded for that wave, then we would advance toward the beach and be signaled when to come in and we'd come in in a straight line uh, across parallel of the beach. And we'd land under fire and uh, the troops would jump off and then we'd get out as fast as we could and regroup to go back to the ship. Uh, I think I was in the fourth or fifth wave. The fire was, was still pretty heavy. We got back to the ship in the late afternoon in time to see the ship sailing away. Uh, we had been left. We had, uh, the ship had had to uh, get out to sea. All of the ships moved out to sea because of the threat of Japanese uh, air attacks and Japanese two-man submarine attacks. So they left us, told us to just gather together and we'll pick you up in the morning. In the water, you were out in the water? Or oh yes, no. We were, no, we were out just out at sea. Out at sea. Uh, they must, how big were these? Were the, um, they're 36 foot boats. 36. And how many people were on each one? On the well, there would just be the crew by that time yeah. because the troops were all gone. They were, they were ashore. Mm -hmm. I would rather have been where I was than where they were. Yeah. Uh, but we tied up about, uh, I guess, 10 or 12, maybe 15 boats together and st stood watches because we were afraid that we would might be sunk by the Japanese subs. And we spent the night there and the ship came back and got us in the morning. So we joined back up with the, with the Knox immediately. So you didn't have any problems with the Japanese at that time? No, not at that time. But we stayed, <clears throat> we still had um, a lot of equipment to unload. And we stayed around uh, at, off the uh, landing area at Saipan for, I suppose, let me see, a week. Um, about a week. And then we came back to, uh, it was July, late July of 1944. We left Saipan and went back to Maui in the Hawaiian Islands and loaded another uh, load of troops and then came back to Honolulu and then sailed uh, from there to uh, Tinian, which is next door to, to Saipan. And uh, we were part of that invasion, but it was we were a very minor part of that invasion. And we sailed from there to, uh, we crossed the equator for the first time and had an initiation of all of the, the people who had never crossed the equator before. And what, what did that involve? All that involves a great pageant, a lot of initiation, a lot of uh, hounding of, of the polywogs, as they're called it, before they become shellbacks, before they cross the equator. Uh, 
At that time, I remember I had one lock of hair left, and it was gone with this, the initiation ceremony. That was the last of my hair. <laughs> uh, it involved uh, being servants to the, the uh, people who had already been across the equator, and very costumed, but uh, it's a prized certificate that you get and uh, a card that I've kept in my memoirs. We sailed from there and uh, went to Manus, which is in the Admiralties, I think. Um, and we stayed there from uh, the first part of October to the end of October and sailed for, no, to the middle of October. And we sailed for Lady in the Philippines. And we participated in the Battle of Lady Gulf. Uh, we were, we came in in the afternoon of D-Day. But we, when we got into Lady Harbor, we had to stream paravanes because there were mines. Paravanes are floats that stick out from the ship and have wires on them, and they cut the mine cables. So you, you can shoot the mines then with a rifle and then blow them up. And we uh, had to spend the night there in the harbor with smoke screen all around because of Japanese airplanes and potential of, air, of uh, Japanese attacks. We landed troops at Lady and uh, were there um, until the 21st of October. The Lady Gulf, the Battle of Lady Gulf was the 20th and we stayed there uh, until the 21st, and then we got out just as uh, the Seventh Fleet was in their big Battle of Lady Gulf with the uh, Japanese fleet. And we sailed down to Hollandia, New Guinea, and uh, we were getting, we loaded troops there but we were there for probably uh, two weeks, during which time I had the opportunity to take one of the boats, and we uh, got a uh, local Dutch uh, warden. It was it's a Dutch Dutch island, and we're taken down and got a chance to go to shore to a native village, and got to see the the natives on New Guinea. Um, and we sailed from uh, Hollandia, New Guinea, back to Lady, and then went through the uh, Surigao Strait west and around the southern end of Mindanao uh, and up to Lingayen Gulf, past Manila and up to Lingayen Gulf. And that was when we were in the heaviest of the kamikaze attacks. And we were uh, on 24-hour alert, uh, were fired on, never were singled out by a, a kamikaze, but saw many of them. And, uh, and we were, in a, of course, in a fleet. And we were a uh, division, we had a division commander on our ships, so we were the first in the line of three three lines of ships. And the, one of the baby carriers just off our port quarter uh, took a kamikaze and caught fire and had to drop out. We went into Lingayen Gulf relative, once we got there relatively uh, unscathed and unloaded troops at Lingayen and then went to uh, Ulithi in the Carolines and stayed there for a rest. And in February, at this point, it was now February of 1945, uh, 
we entered uh, the harbor at uh, Guam and loaded uh, troops for Iwo Jima. Now, while you were having your rest break, what did you do while you were there? If we could just just a lot, lot of maintenance, and mm -hmm. <clears throat> in the case of communications, we were we monitored all of the radio circuits, and uh, we we drilled. Uh, my uh, general quarters post was a, very much exposed right up on the signal bridge, and we did a lot of work with um, lights, flashing lights on, in code, and with uh, signal flags up on the yard arms. And I was in charge of that crew there. The uh, chief of that, the chief petty officer of that crew knew more in five seconds than I would ever learn about it, and so I kept my mouth shut and let him run it. Uh, so you felt fairly I felt comfortable, fair, comfortable. And safe and all while you were there. Yeah, except that it was pretty exposed. It's the top bridge. Uh, but we sailed uh, from Guam to Iwo Jima, and we did not arrive until D-Day plus, I guess, I guess it was D-Day plus one. And uh, from where we were anchored, we unloaded uh, troops. Similar to what you did. Similar to what we did in, in uh, the earlier invasions. But that, by that time, I was not on the boats. I was in the communications office and, and uh, radio room and doing a lot of decoding. Everything came in in code. And we had these code machines that we would load and change every eight hours and decoded. Uh, our captain had us decode everything that came over the wire. Instead of stuff that was just addressed to us, we decoded everything, which made for reams and reams of paper and hours and hours of sitting in front of a typewriter keyboard uh, on this decoding machine. Did you get anything that, that was... Uh, well, we got the... Uh, I remember the, the uh, communication when the fleet had to scramble and get out of Lady Gulf. Uh, when Halsey took the uh, Seventh Fleet up north and left uh, Admiral Spruance, I guess it was, uh, stranded and had to be called back in, not not in code, but in plain language over radio, to get back. And that's just before they battled Sir Gow Strait. If you've ever seen the movies of, of the... Uh, Battle of Lady Gulf, that's very descriptive. We were right in the middle of that. But then I got the communication when the war was over. That's it came over the radio. When you were at uh, Iwo Jima? No, we, we were back from, <clears throat> we got back from Iwo Jima. We sat off the uh, shore at Iwo Jima and <clears throat> were able to observe and listen on radio to all of the airstrikes that were going in on the island which were terrible airstrikes. And I remember walking along the deck one day and seeing this Marine sitting kind of cross-legged on the deck with a radio. And as I went by, I heard him say something. I couldn't make out what it was. I found out later he was one of the Navajo talkers, that uh, they were talking back and forth from the island to the ship and directing uh, the airstrikes, but it was all in Navajo and nobody could understand any of it. Um, we stayed there and, uh, for about four or five days and we had a fairly large sick bay on the ship and we took wounded in and took them back, I think, to uh, Saipan. Uh, yeah, and took them back to uh, Guam. Uh, and took them off there. And then we sailed from there down, to, all the way down to past the Solomons uh, and had a uh, two-month maintenance uh, period in Noumea down in New Caledonia, which is almost down to Australia. So you crossed the... Crossed the equator again, yeah. but from a different perspective, having... <laughs> We were initiating instead of being initiatees. Uh, it was an interesting time to be in, New, in Numea. It's uh, at that time was just really a, a large village, 
It's French. Uh, there was a volcano up on the mountain. We were able to take one of the jeeps and go up and look in the cone of the volcano. And we were there for, I guess, a month or more. Let's see, we got to Noumea on the 23rd of March. No, no. Yeah, on the 23rd of March and left on the 3rd of May. So we were there about six weeks. And uh, came up to Lady Gulf and... Then we're uh, told that we were going to get two months in the States. And that was in May, I guess, of uh, 1945. And we sailed from, I, I'm trying to remember whether we took anybody home with us as far as troops are concerned or not. But we sailed from there to uh, Portland, Oregon. Uh, went in through the mouth of the Columbia River, and we had 60 days in Portland. Uh, half the ship got the first 30 days off leave, and the other half got the second 30 days off. And I was able to fly back to Atlanta then and come back. And <clears throat> we stayed in Portland until, see, we got there in June, so we stayed there until August. And VE day, VJ Day, we were in Portland. We sailed the next day, so we missed all of the celebration of VJ Day. But we sailed from there down to uh, San Francisco, and we were in San Francisco on the 16th of August until the 22nd, and we went to uh, back to Pearl Harbor, and then back down to uh, Inuitok, and Guam, and back to Lady, and then we anchored, we came up into Manila Bay, the war being over, we loaded troops to go back to the States. It was called, the operation was called Magic Carpet, and we took, as they were qualified under the point system they were getting out of the service, we uh, took them from, we sailed nonstop from Manila to San Pedro or Long Beach, California. How and long that was about a three week. Each way? Oh yes. Oh yes. Uh, let's see. No, I, I missed I missed something completely. From uh, and in we sailed from Manila, I said we sailed uh, back to the States. From Manila, <clears throat> that was the second time. From Manila, we sailed over, back over to um, uh, Lingayen Gulf and picked up uh, troops to take in for the occupation of Japan. And that was in uh, September of uh, 1945. And we sailed up, we loaded the troops, and we were going into Nagoya, Japan. But we had to anchor while they cleaned the mines out of Nagoya Harbor. So we were in a very large uh, anchored area <coughs> called Wak Wakanura uh, Bay. And the little town, the Japanese village was called Wakayama. We had to stay there for uh, three weeks, almost three weeks, while they cleaned it out, cleaned out Nagoya. And during that time, uh, we had a typhoon. And we were unable to move the ship at all. We put both anchors out and acted as though we were sailing. In other words, the, the uh, ship was steaming ahead very, very slowly to take the strain off of the anchor chains. But we had, did have an opportunity to go ashore in this little Japanese village and wander up and down and buy some uh, souvenirs. And then we sailed into uh, Nagoya and unloaded troops in a day and a half there. 
and then sailed from there to uh, back to L Luzon. So uh, let me understand. When you were there at Japan, this was before VJ? No, no, no. This is after. after okay, I'm this sorry. is after. Okay. Yeah, the, see, the, the, uh, the uh, uh, surrender was signed, I think it was the 2nd or 3rd of September. And we're now into October. October. Okay. Uh, because we took, uh, <clears throat> we loaded troops to go to Japan on the 21st of September. So we were in, we were in uh, Nagoya, I mean in Wakayama, anchored from, oh, the first week in September, uh, first week in October till the end of October, almost the end. During this typhoon, were most of the people sick or? No, no, <laughs> no, we just, uh, it was almost landlocked. Really? So we didn't, but we, the winds were just howling. And of course rain and some, there was a chop in the, in the bay, but uh, we were afraid that the, the wind was gonna pull, was gonna break an anchor chain. So that's why we stayed as though we were steaming at sea, at sea uh, with two anchors out instead of one and steaming ahead very, very slowly to take the strain off of the anchor chains. Um, from Nagoya, we went down to Luzon, and that's where we picked up the uh, troops to go to the States. And I've already covered that. We got back to Portland in June, and then we sailed from Portland to San Francisco in uh, August. Um, then so we, we got back to the States the, the first time there. How did you feel? <laughs> I couldn't believe that I was seeing the states, and that's a and that became a, a rather important uh, part of my life, which I'll get to okay. later. I know. Imagine uh, it was a beautiful sight. It was a beautiful sight, um, but when we we left uh, San Francisco uh, and sailed back to uh, Manila and picked up another load of troops that were to go into uh, went into um, San Pedro, Long Beach. And from there we got orders to proceed to uh, New Orleans to decommission the ship. So we sailed from San Pedro around, came back through the canal up to New Orleans and had uh, about almost a month in New Orleans at Mardi Gras time. Were you able to get off the ship? The oh yes, flight? yeah, yeah. We were, what they were doing is they were taking off all the guns and all of the heavy stuff because <clears throat> we were going to Mobile to be de decommissioned. And we sailed from New Orleans on Mardi Gras. We didn't get to see the final celebration. Uh, we sailed down the river and out and then back up into Mobile Bay. And the ship was decommissioned in uh, May of 1946 in Mobile. Uh, during the time <clears throat> we were in Long Beach, California, uh, I, on a blind date, uh, met someone. It didn't last just 55 years. Uh, we had maybe three dates before we were married, and she was from Portland, Oregon. Had no connection with my, my having been in Portland, but I've been back to Portland countless times since then. And I always think of when I when I get there, I always think of coming in the first time from sea. We arrived at about midnight. We could hardly see any of Portland. But that's the combat. Then from from there, we were sent. To, I was sent to New Orleans to the Navy, uh, six to the. I've forgotten the num number of that naval district, and was transferred to Charleston to the sixth naval district for decommissioning, and I got out of the Navy in in uh, March of 1946. Uh, before we talk about getting out of the Navy, are there any um, particular? stories or people or events that really stand out in your mind during, during all these places that you went? 
Well, Maui was always a pleasant experience, and I've been back there later as a civilian after the war, and went up to Mount Haleakala, which was a, a, a volcano. Um, were you always feeling scared while you were? Not particularly. Do you get finally to where you oh, yeah. it just becomes a daily routine? It becomes a daily routine. And we weren't, uh, we weren't under fire constantly. <coughs> there were just times in case of the invasions when it was very intense. But uh, not if you were steaming from Guam to New, New Guinea, it was just you would see. Did a lot of drilling and uh, we a lot of zigzagging convoys and signaling convoys with flags. So we, I was busy on the on the signal bridge during all those times because they'd order a zigzag pattern and you'd have to the ships would uh, acknowledge by flag that they had gotten the signal and then when the flags were dropped, that's when you made your turn. In, in zigzagging. How was how were you? Want to hold us up. <laughs> and we're resuming the interview with Mr. Robert Battle for the Veterans History Project. So when you when you got back and you got out of the service, what did you do at that point? Well, when I when I got out of the service, <clears throat> in I I was actually out and on terminal leave in March of 1946. And I went back to Emory and I, I wanted to get a graduate degree. And the Dean of Men uh, had been very active in a lot of things at Emory. And the Dean of Men asked me to come in as his assistant while I went to graduate school. But in the meantime, I went out to Portland and got my bride and brought her back to Atlanta. And I spent the next year working in the dean's office and getting a master's degree at Emory. And then I went to uh, the Atlanta Journal in the advertising department and was there from 1947 to 1949, at which time I went to work for then unknown little company called Vacuum Foods, which had a brand of orange juice called Minute Maid, which later became Minute Maid Corporation and then became the, food, the Minute Maid division of Coca-Cola. And I was a salesman and a district manager and then finally the regional manager for Minute Maid uh, with about six states. And then in 1950, Eight, we, the company changed its sales method from a direct sales force to a network of food brokers, and they gave some of us the opportunity to go into the business for, oursel for our, ourselves. Uh, one in New York, one in Chicago, one in Denver, one in Dallas. I took Atlanta and went in the food brokerage business and remained there until I retired in 1987. When you came back and went back to school, were you able to use VA benefits? Oh, yes. Going back yes. To mm -hmm. Yeah. I had my, yeah, I had my, uh, what did we call it? I guess we call it the VA benefits. Yeah. G, the GI Bill. GI Bill. I couldn't think of the term we used. Yeah. And at that time, during that first year, we were working with, I was working mostly with veterans who had come back and gone back to school. And a lot of them were married, and we lived, they were living in trailers. And there was a lot of having to get used to going back to college or going to college for the first time. But we restarted things like the newspaper and the annual and the interfraternity council and the student government. And I worked on all of those things during that year while I was getting a master's. Were you involved in any veterans groups? Have no, not in any veterans groups. And we did not, uh, I stayed in touch uh, <clears throat> an interesting thing, there were, there were about five of us who reported to the Midshipman School at Columbia University in June of 43 
who decommissioned the ship. We were, we were together the entire time. There were, that was a very happy, it was, it was called a happy ship. There was not a lot of conflict on it and there were very few transfers off and on. There were a number of people who were on the ship for the entire time she was commissioned, from she was time she was commissioned in Brooklyn until she was decommissioned in Mobile. Was she called a happy ship after after the fact or even while you were No, or even the, even then. Mm -hmm. Yeah. People would say, Oh, you are on a happy ship. But uh what was what was your question? I was asking about Oh, veterans. Um, I stayed in in touch with with all of those people that I had gone to midshipman school with, and they have dropped out one by one through death. I still have one uh, contact. Uh, the fellow that I told you that heard the midshipman's band from the, back in the uh, cathedral. I was reading Smithsonian Magazine about five or six years ago, and it was a letter to the editor. And there had been an article in Smithsonian about St. John the Divine, the cathedral. And this fellow had written a letter. And I didn't know where he was. And so I immediately wrote him, and we have stayed in touch ever since. We emailed back and forth all the time. And my wife and I spent a weekend in California with them. Uh, but the rest of the crowd have died. Um, the ship had, had a reunion in, uh, let me see, the first, I can't remember when the first reunions were. Um, it was in Indianapolis, oh, 1993. Uh, and they had probably 40 or 50 there. They've had, uh, there's a group that gets together <clears throat> that I haven't been able to be at they get together about every year or two, but they all they want to go to Pigeon Forge, Tennessee, or to Branson, Missouri, for the entertainment and for their wives to be in the discount malls. So I I stay in touch. The the small group, a small group of the signalmen that I was on the bridge with, we have stayed in close touch. We uh, Christmas cards every year, and we've gotten together three or four times. But that's just about that's dwindled down now to about oh if we get everybody there there may be ten. Are there any experiences or anything that that we didn't talk about that you'd like to? I can't think of anything exciting or interesting. I probably will think of something later. But um, overall, how did how did this? Did the whole experience affect the rest of Well, oh, it changed, changed my life totally, and as I'm sure it did almost anyone who went through that experience. Um, I don't know what I would have done had it, in retrospect had, it, had I not had that experience. I would have probably finished up college, and I don't know what I would have done then. Uh, but it changed my life. My, I met my wife. My, my whole family life changed. Uh, uh, it made a much more mature person out of me. Um, it was it was a life changing experience. I can't think of any other description that fits it better than that. No, just thank you for the opportunity. Thank you very much. Do you want